But um, so yeah, so we're gonna talk about wave function monism here. And um, and so let, let me get, let me jump right into it because I, I, I did like 70s nights. So this is the outline of the talk. Given that it's pretty easy, like the structure is pretty easy, I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm just gonna skip it. Um, so this, this is just because I don't know how to fix the entire titles in LaTeX. So there's no really deep, <laughs> uh, you know, con, um, meaning about this, these acronyms. Okay, so wait. Um, so we were gonna talk about a particular version of, of monism, which I will call wave function metrological priority monism. This is my album that says that, oh, there is one fundamental entity, the universal quantum wave function, or better, whatever it represents, and there are derivative parts, and these there are derivative objects, and these objects are parts, metrological parts. Okay. So now the view. Oh, let me. Okay. Well, I can't do this. So the view has been uh, at attracted uh, considerable attention in philosophy, of physics, and metaphysics. Richard Healy, Stephen French, Peter Lewis, and Alice and I defended it. Now, before we move out. Oh, okay. Before we move on. So. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, so this is gonna be more metaphysics probably than you guys are used to. So I'm gonna take the first few minutes just to, to tell you why I think it's important to do uh, this kind of project in metaphysics. Um, and I'm not being apologetic about it. I, I, just, um, I just wanna give you, and that's the fun part of the talk anyway. So, um, so here's, monism has an incredible, incredible philosophical pedigree. As you can see here, right? And as a matter of fact, you can see it from the quotations here, but, um, but, but you could see if I could give you more quotations that it cuts across space. It has been held in the Western world, in the Eastern world. It cuts across time. You go from Parmenides, basically the, um, the heydays of philosophy to Schaffer nowadays. And it also cuts the analytic continental divide. Okay, so for example, probably a lot of us would classify Hegel as you know, continental philosophy. Um, and, and as you can see, there are varieties of this, right? If you just read, right, you can see that these people are saying very different things. This guy is saying that there exists just one thing, right? These guys saying that, oh, there might be other things, but they're just parts of it. This thing says that, oh, there's one thing and the others depend on that one thing. So you can see already, right, that um, it is, um, um, th there are different theses here defended under the one label moment. So and as a matter of fact, it's not just philosophers, it's philosophers of physics that are interested in that. So here's Alastair Wilson, okay, uh, in Everettian quantum mechanics. This is Stephen French actually criticizing wave function realism, which will be the topic of the talk. And here are two friends of mine in a recent very beautiful paper in Erkantnis um, and they are both present here, Antonio and Davide. So they are discussing a version of, of quantum mechanics in which you do not actually, um, you do not endorse any of the realistic interpretation. You let decoherence do the job. And then they have a very actually plausible argument uh, against in particular this group that says, at the end of the day, chances are you're gonna be coordinated in this, in this point and in an anti-realist attitude towards the metrological structure of the world as I read them, I think they meant you're gonna have to say that there is just one thing without parts. And that's gonna be monism, okay? So as you can see, philosophers of physics are started to be interested in that and rightly so, should I add. Now, as a matter of fact, I, I found an old paper uh, in philosophy of physics that says, uh, that's uh, this beautiful quote that says something like, look, we philosophers, we better take monistic, monistic worldview seriously because if we don't do it, Physicists will do it. And I don't know whether this is supposed to be, you know, bad. Like, oh, we shouldn't let physics, you know, steal our jobs or something. But as a matter of fact, physicists have done that. Like, so here are two physicists. Um, one is due to my hand, because uh, it, it, it was in, uh, there's two N, sorry. Toronto de France, I was in Florence, a physicist in Florence, which actually right, right out from the bat says, well, the world is in some way a single object. And then it's Kafathos, of course, which is a controversial figure, of course, but once again, this is a physicist that concludes the most basic um, and primary level in all physical reality. It's the entire universe, a seamlessly interconnected whole, you know, called the cosmos. I actually even found, 
a, 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 an article in Scientific American that actually says that quantum monism could even save the soul of physics. Uh, now, I didn't read the article, so I don't know what it says. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, and if you're not convinced by now that we should do this, um, let, me, let me actually give you the definitive argument. The definitive argument that you should actually care about monism in that sense is that monism has been a constant preoccupation of some of the greatest literary minds of the Western world. So I'm gonna just provide a few examples. So here is one of the most beautiful poems you will ever read in your life, stars by Emily Bronte. This is exactly the time in which she's writing Wuthering Heights. And this is a poem in which she reflects about what is the real message you know, to take from the incredible beauty and marvel and intricate interconnectedness of all the things. And she says at the end of the, at the, end of the poem that the lesson to draw is that it proves us one. Okay. So, and this is just because I, I titled the, 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 the talk out of all the indifferences to one thing. This is, um, this is in the second edition of Wallace Stevens' Harmonium, what's in the first? Which is a beautiful poem in which it says, look, if you actually abstract away from all the differences, out of all the differences, you're gonna have you know, just one thing. Now, as it just so happened, I think that the most interesting poet for this kind of dialectic is actually John Donne. Now, I didn't put anything of John Donne because when we talk about John Donne, I get easily sidetracked and I just talk about John Donne. Given that I have to do a little bit of philosophy, I just left it, left it without, without any John Donne quotes, unfortunately. But, but here are some, some, literary, some literary masterpieces which will play a role and actually plays an incredible role. So for those of you who actually have spent some time in Switzerland, this is uh, a, a sanatorium in Davos, Switzerland. So the, the infamous Davos. Now, why this is important in this context? This is extremely important. It's extremely important because this is the real, the real uh, setting of Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain. So you can still go there. So this is, uh, uh, you see my hands in the screen, right, guys? So you can, you can go there at the second floor. There is still Hans Karstorp room, number 34. You can go there, get a beer, and you, you can do the same walk that Hans Karstorp does. And why it's important? Well, you may know that there are two philosophers, basically two philosophical figures in the, in the novel, Settembrini and Nafta. And one chapter is dedicated entirely to monism and pluralism. And we will come back to that chapter. So this is the, the fun part, then there's a the boring part, then there's fun again at the end of the talk. Now, this is extremely even more important because 10 kilometers from here, just on the opposite side of the mountain, there is a Rosa where Schrodinger right, was riding, was vacationing with his, with his mistress, and he was riding quantum mechanics as an eigenvalue problem or some, you know, the famous 1926 paper where he introduced the notion of wave function of quantum state, which is the main character of the talk. So basically quantum wave function monism really was born basically between Thomas Mann and Schrodinger in the hills of Switzerland. So I thought, and some of my friends, you know, I've spent a lot of time in Switzerland. I thought it would be good to remind that, you know, they should come back sometime. Okay, good. So this is just uh, for the introduction for the fun part. Now let's do, some, I'm unfortunate, we have to do some philosophy and some philosophy physics. Uh, we will come to back to literature, don't worry, at, at the end. Okay, good. So the first thing I'm gonna do is that, as you see, right, there are different versions of monism. So as a, I think a, a good philosophical practice is to distinguish those. So here's what I will do. I will give you a chart that will be a cartographer for you. So I will take, the, the weakest version of monism is that one, the one you find in one. There is only one fundamental entity. Just deny one and you're gonna be a pluralist. So pluralism is very, very weak. If you think that space-time and Antonio are fundamental, then you're a pluralist, okay? All you need to be a pluralist is that there are two things that are fundamental, okay? Now, as you can see, right, one doesn't say anything whether there are no fundamental things, right? It doesn't say, it just says that there is one that is fundamental. It doesn't say whether there are any that there are not. Now, if you add that there are no derivative ones, you get existence monism. I think the one that Antonio and, and Davide were concerned for the decoherence on the quantum mechanics thing. Now, but of course you might say, look at how extreme it is. It is extreme in the following sense. It either entails that you don't exist, guys, right? It either entails that you don't exist, 
or it either maintains that we are just one, right? That none, no two of you can exist. If Antonio exists, that's all there is, right? So if I exist, that's all there is. Now, of course, it might seem that on the face of it, it's more plausible to say, well, come on, there is one fundamental entity and there are derivative ones. And this is priority monism, as I would call it. But not this, right? In three is completely silent from what relation stands between the fundamental entity and the non-fundamental one, besides being more fundamental than, of course, right? If you plug in different relations, you get different versions of monism, which play in the history of philosophy and physics, different roles. So here's what you get, for example, if you add R, R, the relation R is part whole, the relation R is substance modes, the relation R is pattern structure. You get that, okay? Uh, given that we, have not, we don't have too much time, I'm just gonna focus on this because this is the main actor in the talk. So there, there's one fundamental entity, there are derivative ones, and the derivative ones are parts, actually proper parts of the fundamental form. Okay, this is a very specific thesis. And why did I do that that way? Because if you do these things that way, it just so happens that you can have this beautiful, beautiful, simple chart that if this relation were a total order, you would see that it corresponds to a very simple set theoretic structure, right? A rooted tree, right? It has all the, all the things for a rooted tree, a set theoretic rooted tree, uh, because it total orders and, and so on and so forth. Now, it just so happens, if you, if you just look at it just for a minute, I didn't do any formal work. I have an appendix for that. But it just so happens that if you look closely at the formal work, you can see that you can move by logic alone from right to left along the lines. So if you are here, you can pass from logic alone to here, to here, to here. Same from here to here to here, from here to here. But you never can pass from left to right. Okay. So none of these um, you know, implications go through biologic alone. You do something else. You do either physics or metaphysics, but you can't. If you're here, you cannot just go here without paying some price. Okay, good. So these are the different varieties of monism in the literature. Of course, we're not just interested in monism, given that it's a philosophy of physics talk. We're, we, we're interested in quantum monism. Now, it's, 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 just, it's just almost uncontroversial that if you want to be a monist, you have to be realist about the wave function. Okay, but we all know that, you know, realism about the wave function comes in 3,000 varieties. So he, he, here's, here's a list. I will not even go here because, I mean, these, you're all philosophers of physics, so you all know this actually even better than me. So these are all some possibilities in, in the literature, but what I'm interested in is a particular, um, um, re, particular really realist attitude about the wave function which is what is actually known, unfortunately, as wave function realism to book, even if these are all arguably realist positions about the wave function. So, and according to this view, let's take, let's take the, you know, the toy example of uh, n particle world. The wave function represent a field in three n dimensional configuration space. So that's the realism about the wave function we're talking today. We're not even talking about um, the other ones, I have something in speculations about my feeling as that we will not get to talk about. Okay, and, 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 and famously this has been defended by David Albert, Peter Lewis has defended in a number of places, Jill North has defended in a number of places, though I chatted with her uh, um, uh, just a few weeks ago, she's now thinking back on, 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 on her argument in 2013, and, and now she's been defended in a book length, very insightful book uh, by Alisa Nay, the world, the world in the Wave Function, and for example, in Geneva, we had an entire uh, workshop on that, on which, for example, Davide was one of the invited speakers, so he knows the book very well. So this is actually what we're going to talk about today. Okay, good. And, and now, so the, the particular kind of quantum monism that I'm going to talk, I'm just going to restrict. It's a combination of wave function realism defined that way and meteorological priority monism defined the other way. Okay, that's the combination I'm interested in. And in speculations, there are wild speculations of some other versions of monism you might have. Okay, and, and I put some quotes here just to, 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 to let you see, right, that I'm not cheating. That, for example, Alisa really defends that this in the book. I'm not gonna read it because we don't have time, but I mean, I know that Antonio, for example, trusts me, but I, <laughs> I don't know if everyone else trusts me. So believe me, she does defend this, both in the book. And so this is a paper she wrote before. This is the book. And then, there's also the case of Ismail and Schaffer, which actually
actually discuss at length wave function realism. I think it's a, it might be a little bit more nuanced here, whether they actually really believe in, in uh, what I call the wave function methodological priority monism, but it's an interesting question and it's an interesting issue to, to actually talk about. So, but there are people that really defend this view nowadays, and they think this is the best metaphysical account of non relativistic quantum mechanics, at least as far as ontology goes, without entering the, the, the um, you know, the measurement problem. Now you might be already unhappy with that. I actually wrote a paper saying that the case of monism is particular because I think interpretations matter in that case. But the thought is that they are explicit that their argument cross cuts them. So I'm just meeting them on their own grounds here. Like they say that, I just wanna take the challenge up, okay? But, 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 but I harbor skepticism that um, this can be done at the end of the day interpretation free, but this is, this, is a, this is a bother for another day. Okay, good. So now, now that we have you know, the view under the bed, so what I'm gonna do for, for the next, you know, probably 10, 15 minutes is something, give you a preliminary argument that I see that the two components are in tension, okay? There's a tension between two, component, the two components. And this argument is, is admittedly not you know, really strong, but it's in, very important because it uncovers that tension. And we will see that that, in, that tension is a beast which is not very easy to tame. That's, that's why it's there. And to do that, I have to first actually introduce you to the master argument for the component parts. So what is the master argument for just quantum monism, independently of wave function rate? It's sometimes called the determination argument. Here's another friend of ours. Matteo Morganti summarizing it, but the argument is due to Jonathan Schott. And Jen and Ismail now endorsed it. And now Jonathan has wrote, uh, uh, there's, there's the new SEP entry, uh, stands for like triplet entry, in, in which he, he goes over again uh, the argument. So the argument works like this. And the quotations are always here to let you see that I'm not cheating. I'm not just throwmanning my way through these things. Okay, so here, here's how the argument works. So you get, you, you get a principle which is called whole part determination. For any quantum whole W with parts P1, P2, Pn, the state of the whole always determines that of the parts, whereas the converse does not hold. In particular, it does not hold for entangled states, okay? So from this semi-mathematical statement, this is not a mathematical statement as a matter of fact, but from the semi-mathematical statement, Schaffer says, the lesson to draw is six. This is a metaphysical lesson to draw from part. Entangled systems are fundamental holes. Their parts are derivative. Why? Because the, the holes always determine the parts, but the converse does not hold. Now, I think, being the nitpicking metaphysician that I am, that you need a lot of metaphysics to pass from here to here. But given that it's not my aim to actually, I'm gonna grant the arguments, given that my aim is not to challenge the arguments, I'll just leave it at that. But we can come back in the Q&A, okay? So, so you get to six, and then there's another premise that says, look, the cosmos, which is the metallurgical fusion of all concrete objects, is an entangled system. Of course, from six and sevens and baby logic, not even baby logic, like very, very infant logic, you get that the cosmos is, is fundamental. Now, you might think, well, this, this stops short, right, of, of, of telling me that the, the monism, because monism says that there is only one, right? So you, you need the uniqueness claim. Now, Schaffer has a way of passing from that claim to the uniqueness claim. And he has what is called the timing constraint. He thinks that any answer to the question, what are the fundamental entities in the world, should, um, should be constrained by this guy, which says that the fusion of the fundamental things is the universe of the cosmos and no two distinct fundamental things overlap. Now, this sounds innocent. And as a matter of fact, uh, Schaffer argues for it, but here's, uh, it, if you want to you, I mean, I don't have the blackboard, but I can prove to you that it's so strong that it delivers the following. If the universe is fundamental, nothing else is. And if Antonio is fundamental, the universe is not fundamental. Well, modulo the fact that Antonio is different from the universe, of course, right? So it's very strong. And of course, if you have that, now, now monism really falls because the universe is fundamental and then every, everything else overlaps the universe. Therefore, the universe is the only fundamental thing on pain of violating the, the timing constraint. 
So it's true that once you get there, it, it does give you mineralogical priority moments. So this is the argument for quantum monism, the master argument. What's the master argument for the other component? We function monism. And this, this seems like a Stanford Encyclopedia philosophy argument. It's, it's not. It's called the separability argument. This is, the, this is by Alisa's, for example, own admission. By the way, Alisa was great. She gave me comments on this paper. Um, and by Alisa's own admission, that's the master argument. She thinks that this is the best argument that there is for wave function groups. And the best argument goes like this. Separability and locality are desirable features of uh, fundamental metaphysics. Um, wave function realism is the only metaphysics of quantum mechanics. I thought no relativistic quantum mechanics. She thinks she can actually export it to the relativistic regime. I think that th that chapter actually has a lot of problems. So I'm just gonna stick to the non-relativistic ones. That is both separable and local. And of course, all else being equal, we should prefer wave function realism with triangles. Okay. So these are the two arguments, the main arguments. Now, what I'm gonna argue now is that if you look at these two arguments, you should see a tension between the demands of a monistic metaphysics and a separable metaphysics. Okay. And this is just a preliminary argument, but it's important once again, right? It really points the finger to, to a tension, I think a genuine tension, that everyone that holds these two pieces together has to actually somehow be solved. So, and, and, and the tension is, is, is revealed if you look at, 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 at separability, right? The, the principle that actually um, uh, has the lion's share in the, in, the, in the separability argument for wave function. And there are different formulations, but at the art, this is what, what you get. A metaphysics is separable if it admits of composite holes, and for any admit, um, admissible composite holes, the state of the parts determine the state of the whole. Okay. So, that, so Alisa gives this kind of this formulation in a bunch of places. She quotes the classic formulation of Don Howard. And then there's a beautiful paper by the minutes, which I met just in Oxford, you know, tracing it back to Einstein and so on and so forth. Even if Einstein actually, uh, the minutes argues they had something different in mind, as a matter of fact. But so the separability claim is the separability. There are composite, there are composite things. And if you fix the parts, you fix the whole. Now, I don't know whether there are any metapositions in the room. I left the termination willingly underspecified because I think that if you look at the metaphysics of it, then, then it matters with which relation you plug it in. Supervenience, grounding, uh, ontological dependence, explanatory dependence, and so on and so forth. But as a matter of fact, it doesn't matter for this argument, so I'm not gonna actually go over, you know, um, I don't have any preferences uh, in this. Of course, uh, I work in Geneva and Fabrice Correa is the, is the head of my department. So if I say that grounding doesn't have a shot, I'll be fired. So, so let's say that grounding is a shot, uh, but, uh, but nothing depends on this. So I, I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so now to the argument. Okay, so first of all, let me give you the, the, the official formulation of the view. The official formulation of the view a little bit dramatically is the following. The wave is the only fundamental entity and derivative ones, which comprises Davide, Antonio's, Antonio's chair, uh, this cup of mine, Emilia's hair and so on and so forth. These are the only trees that I see in the screen, sorry guys, are parts of the wave. Okay, so here's an admittedly unfair, perhaps preliminary argument. It, it, it's admittedly preliminary. We function pri merological priority monism threatens to undermine the master arguments in favor of its components. Why? Well, it's easily seen, right? So there, are, there is no separable ontology that obeys whole part determination. Conversely, there is no ontology that obeys whole part determination that is also separable. And, you know, oh, ciao, Daniele. Now I see you, I don't know why uh, you, you switch. Um, so an entangled hole, why right? would you just take an entangled hole, right? An entangled hole with property parts P1 and P2, uh, this is a part of a fundamental entity. As, as for, for all I said, right, is in the remit of separability. Therefore, separability demands that the state of W is determined by the state of P1 and P2, which goes against whole part determination, okay? Now, so this, this uncovers the tension, right? It seems that the demands of these two components of the view actually pulls in different directions, okay? Um, so what can you do? Well, for, the first thing that you can do, you can just let go of the arguments. Just let go of the arguments, find other ones, okay? Sure, um, you can always do that, right? 
but the, the, you know, they're the master arguments for a reason. But on top of that, I really believe that this points to a, to a genuine intention within uh, the position itself, no matter, okay, which arguments you take to support it. And what is this general attention? Well, the general attention is the following. Monism in general is a metaphysics that points to top-down determination from holes to parts. That's how it's generally conceived in knowledge. By contrast, separability seems a paradigmatic case of bottom-up from parts to holes. That's where the tension comes from, okay? So now, so, so what I will do now is it, I will actually try to find ways to assuage at least the tension and give the view that, uh, that, that, that we started with the best shot. And in doing that, I had fantastic reviews for this, for this paper. And um, so in, in doing that, what, what I will do is that I will just put forward the best version of the view that I can think of, okay? And then try to argue against that, which I think it's dialectically the right thing to do. My go-to example in this case, it's always David Lewis uh, chapter three in the plurality of words in which it doesn't just argue against, you know, one particular version uh, that he found in a paper against ersatzism about possible words. He built the best, the best version that one can build and then argue against that. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna do the same. And doing the same, I, I, I have to, to say that clearly because in doing the same, I will go a little bit further than what Alisa, for example, explicitly endorses in, in the book. And I will flag that out so that you will know that Alisa never wrote this thing, I did. Okay. So let's go in. Okay. So, and I will take actually the, the lead from something that Alisa herself says, which I think it's actually insightful. She doesn't say that when we function metaphysics is separable. She says it's fundamentally separable. Okay. So these I take, and then, well, then we can go back and, and read again. These I take it that, um, you know, it's a qualified version of separability, not you know, just the simplistic version that I have in the first slide. Okay, so now, given the fundamental separability, you know, the first thing that, that you have when you have an a, adjective modifier, right, in philosophy, or you, the first thing you do, because it's the easiest thing to do, is just you restrict the quantifiers in the formulation, right? That's the, the, the first thing you do. Now, if you restrict the quanti, there's a bunch of ways of doing that. If you restrict the quantifiers in the formulation, you know, the formulation, you know, if X is composite, then the state of X is, is fixed by the state of the parts, or uh, for, every, for every X, um, X, uh, X state is uh, fixed by the, the states of its parts. If you restrict the universal quantifier that I just gave you, right, you end up with these things. Now, I don't think it works, so I'm just gonna go to the best shot, okay? But we can come back if you want to talk about. So this me trying different versions of restricting quantifiers to actually find a version of separability which will deliver what we want. And what we want is to actually remove the tension between the demands of a monistic metaphysics and a separable metaphysics. Okay, so, okay, so this is them. Um, and how will I do that? I, I'll do that taking the lead from Alisa itself on one hand and from contemporary metaphysics in the other. And I think this is actually the picture behind Alisa's book anyway. And the picture is the following. Nature comes structure in the hierarchy, okay? And the, 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 the entities in, in a hierarchy of levels and entities in those levels are ordered by relations of ground, ontological dependence, whatever. Whatever you think, whatever relation you like, which underpins claims of relative fundamentality. That is, if you are here, you're more fundamental than what is here. I don't know whether you see me, guys. Okay. This is Ted Sider and Bliss, um, um, Sider, Bliss and Priest actually saying that. Okay. As of now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a sketch, okay, of what wave function realists, as a matter of fact, say, independently of, of, of their um, endorsement of monism. And then I'm going to make it a little bit more rigorous because I like to do formal work because I like games, basically. Okay, so here's the sketch. This is just the sketch. Okay, there is a fundamental level, the configuration space level. The only object at the level is the wave. There are no proper parts of the way at this configuration space level. Okay, now this is the crucial claim that Alisa and I 
neither endorses nor rejects in the book. She doesn't say, okay? But for me, for my aunt, for the arguments I'm gonna put forward, this is crucial. So I'm just gonna flag it that this is not something that if you read Alisa's book, you'll find she explicitly says yes, or she explicitly says no, okay? But I think it's crucial. And all the other ones, you can find them in, in, in her book. So, and that there is a derivative level, the three-dimensional level, there are many objects, including compo composite dolls. Now I can say also Daniele, because I see Daniele as well. These are all parts of the way. Now, consider one such composite hole, W, maybe Daniele's couch. Um, the state of the parts of the couch are determined by something about the way. Finally, those somethings about the way that determines the states of Daniele, of the parts of Daniele's couch, also determines the state of Daniele's couch. That's the rough sketch, okay? Now, before I do a little bit of a more rigorous work here, I'm gonna defend this claim that there are no proper parts of the wave at the configuration space level. Why should I defend this claim? Once again, because I cannot just say, oh, they all have it, so I'm just gonna take that. No, they don't. Like, they neither explicitly deny nor explicitly endorse. But this is important, I think. So here's my argument. Well, if it had proper parts at the, at the configuration space level, given that wave function realism is a configuration space separable metaphysics, it would undermine the very rational for being a monist in the first place. Why? Because look, if you, if you would fix the state of those configuration parts, you would fix everything else. Why? Because it's separable. So it would fix everything about the way, which in turn fixes everything else. Okay. It's really separability, at least at configuration space level, which actually tells you that it has to be an atom. Because if it's not an atom, then you should be pluralist about the parts of the wave rather than the wave. Because one job that the fundamentalia, we, we think that the fundamentalia should do, right? And we can come back at the end of the Q&A about this, because I think this is a subtle point uh, in the formal work about fundamentalism, for example. You know, they have to fix everything else, okay? So given that, if, if, the, if the wave at parts at the configuration space level, you should be a pluralist, given that you wanna be a monist, I mean, the talk is based like this, you should take that, um, the, the, the wave is not an atom, it's just that all of its parts are here, okay? In the, 3D, in the 3D world. Good. So now let me make these things a little bit more precise. I'm gonna do it with a fact talk and a primitive relation of determination between facts. This is just because this is done Usually this is done and there are logics for this. So then I can piggyback on the logics that are already there. I can just give my, can just give my definitions and then, and then go and check that it actually matches the logic. It's gonna be a model of some logics that we already know. Now, I don't think that facts, by, by, by the way, are, are necessary, uh, but, but there are a few things that are necessary to run the argument and we can come back once again in the Q&A. What I do need explicitly is the following things about the determination relation. That is um, transitive, and it can be plural in the first argument. That is, as a matter of fact, a plurality of facts can determine a single fact. Now, facts are arranged in levels of different relative fundamentality, and the configuration space level cont contains just configuration space facts. You should think of this just as, you know, the worldly counterparts of configuration space propositions which are the propositions that you know, contain just configuration space vocabulary and are closed under logical operations, basically. Same thing for the 3D levels. You know, they, they, they just, you know, the wave function has intensity such and such, that configuration space point, so on and so forth. And the 3D level contains, this cup is in the kitchen or something like this. Okay, let me, let me do what I do best, some, some, some formal work here. Okay, so given, given, given the formal apparatus I'm, 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 I'm using, here's my proposal. Level L1, Li is more fundamental than level Lj, if and only if. For every fact, so let's take this level, for every fact in this level, there is a fact in this level or a collection of facts. I will just leave that aside because it can be plural in the first argument. That somehow determine that, okay? Now, once I have levels relative fundamentality, I can define level absolute fundamentality. Level Li is absolutely fundamental, or in short, fundamental. If there is no level, there is more fundamental. And a level is derivative if it's not fundamental. That's not, that's not that, that deep. Now, an, an entity, absolute fundamentality, an object, an event, whatever, 
is absolutely fundamental. If there is a fact about or, or it involves or, or, it, or as a component, whatever you want to plug it in, that is um, in the absolutely fundamental. Level. So you define absolute fundamentality for levels, and then you piggyback to do that um, for, for objects that involve in those facts. And the object is derivative if it's not fundamental. Now, why do I think that this construction I just gave, right, Hernitsky, I think it ends in two facts. First of all, it captures what we function monist, what we function realist, sorry guys, want to say independently of monist, even the ones that are not monists. They all want to say that the configuration space level is, um, at least if they're not completely sophisticated, the configuration space level is the fundamental level and the three-dimensional level is, is the derivative level. You know, and, and, and our world of chairs and, and Daniele's and Antonio's and blah, 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 this, this is derivative. And, it, and, and, and more to that, it actually saves the, 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 the view from the argument I just gave. Why? Because now you, you could do that. 3D facts about parts, take a whole, which is derivative of my table, take a fact about the parts of the table for any three-dimensional fact, right? There are configuration space facts about the way that determine the state of the facts. And these configuration space facts that determine the individual three facts about the state of individual parts of, of the three-dimensional object also collectively determine the state of the whole, okay? So why is this important? Well, it's important because the state of the whole, right? The state of Daniel's couch, of my table, of this cup, is not fixed by the state of its parts, rather, it is fixed by the states of the wave that fix the states of its parts. And this is the crucial bit, right? This mouthful thing here is the crucial bit. The fact that, that the, the, the state of the whole is not fixed by the state of its part is actually the reason why this is consistent with whole part determination. And that is why it solves the tension. That's the crucial bit. You can see it this way. It doesn't use separability. It uses separability store. It admits of composite holes, and for any admissible composite holes with parts, there are facts that are starred facts, I will call them, okay? That determine for each fact that the part is in a particular state. It determines that facts, and the collection of facts determine also the fact that the hole is in that state. Now, crucially, as you can see, the starred facts, as we will see in a moment, are not facts about the parts, okay? That's the crucial bit. And here's an example, right? So, because I'm, I, was, so I'm, I was asked to actually uh, give a little bit more um, flash, give, give, give a little bit more intuitive, let's say, grip on, on, on this very abstract notion. So this is a, a configuration space representation of a two-particle world and my exercise in LaTeX, I mean, in TIC. And so he, here's what you have is that, right? So you can say that local facts about the wave uh, such as, you know, has this intensity of this amplitude and phase here and this amplitude and phase here. Just, just because determine the global facts that it has, um, it has amplitude and phases such and such, okay? And they will determine, right? For example, the state of the, the state of the part here, which is represented by, you know, projection A plus projection B, same for the particle two, projection A plus projection B. And the same facts, right, will also, right, determine the fact that this guy is in the singlet state, basically, okay? And given that, given now that the determination is transitive, okay, the local facts of the wave will actually determine the global, the, 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 the facts about the three-dimensional whole. So that's the, that's the thing. Okay, good. So, but, so this should make you clear why separability is not inconsistent with part, all part determination. Why? Because I form, I formulated exactly in such a way that it doesn't require the, the determining facts, the start facts, to be facts about the parts. In fact, as I told you here, they will not be about the parts. They will be about the wave. And by the way, the local facts about the wave, they're all facts about the wave, given that the wave does not have any parts. Okay. So the state of the quantum world will not be fixed by the parts as separability means. Rather, it will be fixed by something of which W itself is part. Separability is not incompatible uh, with, with all part determination. It's, it's not only compatible with that, right? It's not just compatible. In the case at hand, 
In this case, when you actually plug it in the details, the, the quantum details, it is a case of top-down determination, okay? So now, where are we at? Okay, so the good thing is that we found a notion of separability, which is, so what we did is basically like, we weakened the notion of separability so as to actually um, avoid the tension of the monist metaphysics demand. Now, where, where do we land though? So you might have the impression that this is such a deflammatory notion of separability that it cannot do, the job that it's supposed to do. And, and, and in fact, I suspect that that's the case. So, because now, right? So if you wanna be a, both a monist and, and a wave function realist, my suggestion is that you have to have separability start rather than separability. So now, if you go, you have to rerun the argument for wave function realism using separability start rather than just separability. And the argument will look like this. We look separability start and locality are desirable features, and wave function realism is the only ontology that's both separable star and local. Now, and th th there's another new paper to write here whether these actually are actually true. <laughs> I, so the, the paper is already long, so I will not go there. I will just say the following. Separability and separability star are so different, as a matter of fact. One is surely a bottom-up determination relation. The other is compatible with top-down, and in some cases, it is a top-down, that I don't think that any argument for the, uh, for the previous premise, eight and nine are just the same premises with separability rather than the separ separability star. You cannot say that an argument for eight and nine, uh, I don't even remember what the arguments by, by Elisa are, as a matter of fact now. Um, maybe David remembers them. Uh, so they're not ipso facto arguments for the start premises. Now you need to do the job again, okay. I will not do it because I think that's the best version. And what I want to do is that, let's suppose, let's be super charitable and see, say that this will work. Okay, so this will work now we have, you know, the tension is still there, I think. Okay, but there is a way of massaging the tension into having, you know, a, a solid position. Now, what I want to discuss for the rest of the, of, of the paper is the consequences of those positions once you have this view. Uh, and, and then I, I leave you actually, uh, you know, um, draw the conclusion. Maybe you say, okay, this is not a position I wanna endorse anymore. Or maybe you think that, this is not a position you wanted to endorse anyway in the first place. And so I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna give you the, the, the consequences for meteorology, the theory of particles and location. The first one, because I think uh, if you are in Warsaw, you should do some meteorology because I think the Lesniewski is buried there. And so I think you should do it. It's just a matter of respect. And I do meteorology all the time and I like meteorology. And the second is just because I'm writing a book on formal theories of location and its applications to metaphysics and science in which this will play a part. Okay. And then I love to do formal theories of location. So first, meteorology. Okay, this doesn't matter. This is another notion of separability. Doesn't matter. The thing, the, 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 thing, the thing that you have to remember is just that as we saw, right? If you have the view we, we actually um, got to, you actually endorse the view that uh, the, um, the wave doesn't have any parts at the configuration space there. All its parts, right, are um, at, in the three-dimensional level. Okay. Now, take the fusion of all the three-dimensional objects, that is, take the concrete object that has all the other objects as parts, like me, Daniele, Antonio, Davide, Emilia, couches, chairs, horses, flowers, whatever, okay? Call it S for some, okay? Now, sum is not the wave, right? Why? Well, just run a very stupid Leibniz argument, Leibniz law argument. It's a derivative object, whereas the wave is fundamental. So S is a part of the wave, but it's different from the wave. Just standard meteorology will tell you that then therefore it is a proper part of the wave. It's not just a part, it's a proper part. Why is this important? Because as I don't know how many of you know, there are now, principles in meteorology that will spell trouble for the guy. Why? One of these principles is called weak supplementation. It says that if X is a proper part of Y, then there is a part of Y that doesn't share any part with X. 
Well, and, and strong supplementation actually is stronger in the logical sense. Strong supplementation entails weak, but the converse does not hold. And, as, and, and, and you can see it because basically they have the same concept, right? Why is this a problem? Well, we just saw that the fusion of the three-dimensional things is a proper part of the wave by the argument we just gave. Then the consequent will tell us that there is a part of the wave that doesn't share any part with the sum of the three-dimensional things. But what can that be? Right? It cannot be any three-dimensional object. Why? Because of course, any three-dimensional object will overlap the sum. And it cannot be even something, uh, a, a proper part of the wave of the configuration space level, because it doesn't have any. So where does this part come from? Right? Now, you might think that, uh, oh yeah, that, that this is the argument I just run. So you might think that, wait, all you, all you need to do, right, is just give up this principle, okay? And as a matter of fact, unfortunately, I defended in print a system of mereology which is weaker than that. That is, that has a decomposition principle which is weaker, has quasi supplementation which is weaker than weak supplementation. So I, I, I'm not actually, I'm not the guy to make that point, right? Because I defended a weaker one. But uh, that doesn't mean that, I mean, a lot of people believe weak supplementation is just analytical part. And as a matter of fact, the overall case for monism in some, in some cases, just hinges on crucial methodological principles. And as a matter of fact, for example, Schaffer, which is the paradigm, paradigm contemporary defender of monism, crucially relies on classical extension of methodology, on which these two guys are theorists. At least these guys are theory. In some, in some formalization, these guys are an axiom. But you can actually have just unrestricted composition and transitivity, um, and, and you will do the job. So, Yes, you can give those up, but you know there's a price to pay. Okay, now and I think that uh, you know the consequence for location are even just more uh, controversial. And you, you you probably saw right already at the start why they're controversial. Well, by by their own admission, the wave is located in configuration space. They say so, and you know their its parts, you know the, the three dimensional objects are located in three dimensional space. But we used to think that parts and homes, right, share the same location. I mean, or, or, or at least the same space, right? So Alisa actually explicitly recognizes that. Some may be concerned, this is what I'm gonna read because that's important. Some may be concerned about viewing the relationship between the wave function microscopic particles, uh, talking about particles, as one of all two parts, due to the fact that parts and their holes typically uh, seem to be located in a common spatial framework. But then she adds, However, this is not a general requirement for meteorological relations to apply. And I think she's completely right. If you look at any meteorological textbook, uh, like they will not say anything about locations of parts of it. So I think that she's right. What I think, what I think, but I think she downplays the problem here. And I talked to her several times about this. Why? Because it's not, this is the, the claim that parts and holes are located within the same space. It's not a claim about meteorology per se. It's, about, it's a claim about location. And the theory, the form, even the formal theory that actually tells you about the relationship between the location of parts and holes is not meteorology per se. It uses meteorology, but it's not meteorology. It's just the formal theories of location. And as of now, I'm just gonna give you a crash course in formal theories of location so that you will buy the book when I finish written and, 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 and well, if some publisher picks it up, of course, otherwise, I'm just sending you the PDF. So the two notions are exact location and weak location. Okay, so exact location here. So this is the SEP entry, which I am gonna, use, I'm, I'm gonna actually um, help Cody Gilmore uh, update. So exact location is basically uh, the region of space, the region of whatever space you think you're located at, which exactly fits you, okay? That is exactly the same shape, size, uh, the same measure. For example, in my case, you know, it's gonna be a substantive Lebesgue measure, I would say especially in two dimensions, uh, but, but you know, very short limit measure in, in the y direction. And weak location is location in the weakest sense possible. Like X counts as weakly located a spatial region, for example, if it's, the region is not completely free of that thing. So for example, Antonio is exactly located at the Antonio shaped region that he's now occupying, like touching his beard, and he's weakly located in Warsaw, he's weakly located where his heart is, 
if he sticks his arms outside the window, is weakly located both in the room and outside the room, right? Because even outside the room is not free. Now, <clears throat> here's a principle that when I did the formal part, just the formal part of location with Fabrice, we say that it's almost non-negotiable, which says if X is part of Y and X is exactly located at R, then Y is weakly located at R. That means that, for example, if Antonio is exactly located at the re an Antonio shaped region in, in uh, you know, in, in his room, and his heart, okay, is located at this heart region, then Antonio is weakly located at the region, right? That seems just so natural. Of course, that region of his heart is not completely free of Antonio. It has a heart there, right, which is completely natural. But of course, now the dilemma arises for these guys. Why? Because Either you should deny this very plausible principle, or you should accept that the wave is located in 3D space, which they usually don't. Okay. How, do you, how to see that? Take the very special case in which a wave function and non-zero value at just one point in, in, in 3N configuration space. This is a case in which N particles would be exactly located in different three-dimensional regions. Okay. Now, every part, every particle is a part of the wave, just by what Alisa told us, right? They are exactly located in a spatial region in 3D space. Therefore, right, the consequence of this, of this principle, right, tells you that the wave is located, albeit weakly, in three dimensional space. So either deny this or say that the wave function is here. It's not in configuration space, it's also here. Which is not a bad, but but you know there, there is a way uh, there is a way of looking at the wave function which delivers exactly that. But this is just a multi-field way, which I think at that point you should go for the neutral. So now one can push the point that okay, got it, you you know nitpicking metaphysician. But of course this is just very ex it's extremely unlikely that the wave function is just you know it's just there's only one point. And which, which the, you know, which on the support in the way of the wave function configuration. Usually the wave function is spread. Okay, why is this important? Well, in such a case, if you look at the formal rendition which I have in the academics, it turns out that the antecedent of these guys falls. Therefore, the principle is trivially true, right? Just by infant logic. So it's not a problem. Now, but I think that there is a principle which a weaker principle, weaker in the logical sense. In the logical sense that this guy entails this guy, but this guy doesn't entail the other, okay? Which basically have, it's the same principle, you just replace exactly located with weakly located. Okay, now, now, now I see only that. It's a, it's a, Zoom is a weird place. Um, so now- uh, Cla Claudio, sorry, can I ask you just, yeah. uh, just to follow the argument? Um, when you say it's lo located, uh, mm -hmm. principle 2024. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, if X is located the region X, then Y is weakly located. Uh, mm -hmm. Located is referring to the same space for X and Y, yeah, or the same amount, right? Be a you can see the same variable, right? So you can see it's the same variable, R and R. So in, in, if you do it formally, which you will see, it's exactly the same thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Principle. Okay, thank you. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So in the, I mean, I didn't want to do formal work here because there's no need, uh, but, but but I have an appendix and you will see it clearly. Yeah, you're completely right, it's the same. Okay, now this is the same principle. I just replaced exact location with weak location. Right? Now, and now in this case, even in this in the general case, now the antecedent of that is true. Because of course, three-dimensional particles are weakly located in space. That's just what it means to be in space, okay? And, and, the, and the consequence is the same. So if the consequence is the same, it delivers the same conclusion. That Alisa should say that the wave is in 3D space. Now, as a matter of fact, I, I'm gonna go a step further here. And I'm gonna say that I have a formal theory that delivers, not that this is just plausible, they are theorems, okay? So how do I do that? So I take weak location as a primitive and I'm gonna say, so, so these, are, these are the definitions. So you got entire location. I'm, I'm not gonna go over the definition. I'm gonna give you the intuitive thing. Okay, so entire location says, it, it, it's the location that I have, for example, in this room where I'm all contained, right? So, and you can define it from weak location and say, well, you're, you start from your weak location 
and then you are entirely located at every region that overlaps that. Okay. And pervasive location is, is the other way, right? Is is the regions that I feel? Is the regions where, where basically where my parts are, right? So the region overlaps, then then you're weakly located. So look, exact location is the conjunction of that. You're exactly located where you're both entirely and pervasively located. Now think of this this way. So you start from so I'm I'm I'm, I'm contained in this room right now. So now you zoom in from my entire location, right? So you say, okay, let's zoom in. Let's Am I entirely here? Yes, just keep going. Am I entirely here? Yes, let's keep going. Am I entirely here? Yes, yes, let's keep going. At a certain point, I'm not gonna be entirely here, right? Because my hand will be out. Do the same thing for pervasive. So you start from entire as you zoom out, you start from pervasive and you, so you zoom in, or you start from pervasive and you zoom out. You, you, you start from my heart and you say, do I feel the region of my heart? Yes. Do I feel this with this bigger region? Yes, keep going. Do I feel this bigger region? Yes, keep going. When they two meet is where I'm exactly located. It's just the same things if you think about this that actually Lebesgue did for Lebesgue measure in, and now we do it with, you know, with the sigma algebra and then we define you know, a function from the sigma algebra. But, but, but if you read the entire, the, the, the Lebesgue original thing, what he did was, okay, we define an outer measure then we minimize that. We define an inner measure, we maximize that. And when they coincide, that's the Lebesgue measure. That's the same thing here, okay? And I have the appendix to show the formal one. If you do that and you add the following thing, the exact location of a hole is just the sum of the exact location of its proper parts. Then I can show you that 24 or 25, which are the, the problematic principles, they're not just principles that I like, they're just theorems of your theory. You, you can just prove them. So, so the thought is that now, now it seems that given that, uh, you know, the theorems, I mean, there's the, even more pressure uh, to the wave function realist, which also wants to be a monist. It doesn't undermine at all wave function realism per se. It's just the combination here that's the problem. And, 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 and you can see that the combination is, is, that, is, is the one causing the problem. Because here's what actually I think, uh, Alisa I, 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 I actually replied to me, which I think is a great point, as a matter of fact. Wait a minute. Look, maybe it's just because you, Claudio, right? You, you like to do the formal work and you just thought in classical terms when you were laying down the principles and even the definitions, right? Because, you know, in that, those cases, a theorem, so it's not just principles that I like. We took that for granted just because we were thinking in classical terms. Perhaps the argument you just mentioned, right? Just, it's, it's just telling us that when we pass the quantum wave, just our axiom, we should just revise our principles of location and maybe definition. It's the same thing we did in meteorology. I, I don't, I, I, once again, I see only David. I don't know whether Thomas Bigai is here, which I thought is in Barcelona, right? So Thomas has a beautiful exchange in meteorology about quantum mechanics with Adam Carlton. Adam Carlton has a paper saying, oh, we should revise our principle of meteorology because quantum mechanics actually undermines every fusion principle. And then Thomas replies to that. Maybe that's the same here. Maybe quantum mechanics doesn't force us to actually just revise principles of, uh, of many others, but also principles of location. Now, what I want to say here is that I, I, in general, I am behind this kind of arguments 100%. I think that metaphysics should be actually look at physics and if physics, you know, and should be changed if the physics tells us something new. Now, but it's also important to see this is not just quantum mechanics that is forcing us to discard principle 24 and 25. It's quantum mechanics plus the claim, right? That particles are parts of the wave function. That's what's causing the issue here. And this last claim, my guess is that it's not part and parcel of quantum mechanics in and on itself. This is a metaphysics claim that once you see the argument, we might, you might well say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine in, in, in revising things in the light of quantum mechanics, but this is not, this is quantum mechanics plus this thing. And perhaps I just want to give up this claim, the metaphysics claim, which I think it's, it's what you should do, but I don't want to push my line around. I'm, I'm just happy to tell you, I mean, just, just happy to drive the point home that this is not just quantum mechanics dictating these changes. It's quantum mechanics plus a piece of substantive metaphysics. And in the light of the above, you might prefer to give up the metaphysics claim about 
the particles are parts of the wave function rather than give up, rather than give up uh, you know, the principles of location. As a matter of fact, to me, it's better to give up this. I'm, I just don't see, unfortunately, the lure uh, in, in, you know, to understand the relationship between the objects and, and, and wave function as parts. And, and I see that with a, <laughs> with a sad face because meteorology is one of the two things I really know. It would be good if there were parts because then, you know, uh, the world will, you know, will tailor to my, to my knowledge, but unfortunately I don't think this works, but it's up to you, okay? So now, if you are like me that thinks that in, in the face of the above, you should, you should actually, if you want to be, um, if you want to be a wave function realist and a monist, I think you should just give up on the meteorology. Now, of course, if, 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 you, are, if you are with me, now, now the speculations are, okay, so now what? Suppose I want to be a monist and, you know, or a wave function realist, then you should, you should look for other combinations. And here's are some, you know, some combinations. Like, I think my, my, my gut feeling tells me that if you're a wave function realist and you want to be a monist, you should go for substance mode. But this is just a wild speculation, okay? Or space-time meteorological priority. If you want to go with meteorology, then, then go with state, something close to space-time, space-time, space, 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 space realism, or something like, um, you know, perhaps and there, was, there was a suggestion, a well, fantastic suggestion from Rafi, like go for, go for multi-field and then somehow argue that primarily, you know, the multi-field, um, you know, given that, that we have David, and let's talk a little bit about multi-field as well, you know, uh, argue that, you know, primarily it attributes, you know, a global property to the entire space-time perhaps, and then only derivative to its parts, and so on and so forth, and structure pattern, and, 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 and once, you, once, once you actually open the door, like, you can even go as far as having actually hybrid accounts. I mean, we're almost out of time, right? So I'm just gonna just, so if, if you want to do it things properly, right? So here's the formal work behind so that you can see that you can prove what I said. I didn't put it in the paper, I didn't put it in, because this time the formal work in itself, it's not, it's just I like to do it. And you, you know, so if, if you do it, you know what, you know that it, you can back up the claim that I made, but this is just for another day. Now, before we finish, this is the, the other fun part. Um, so perhaps one should, you know, as I told you, right? So th there is this huge discussion in the Magic Mountain about monism and pluralism. And one of the philosophers, the, 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 the Jesuit philosopher, uh, the Schopenhauerian, Schopenhauerian philosopher, basically, you know, has this fantastic thing about this fantastic argument against monism. And it's, doesn't your monism bore you? It's just boring. <laughs> Which I found an extremely interesting argument. Just if, if, if you could only make that argument for a lot of positions, doesn't your nominalism bore, bore you? It's just boring. So now, as a matter of fact, um, I might think that it's false, but I, my guess is that it's not boring at all, as a matter of fact. And also the, the work of Antonio and Davide, I think, showed us that, you know, it's very problematic, but maybe there's a way of actually getting even to existence monism, which I didn't even talk about here. Now, in, instead of actually going there, I think that one thing that we should learn as metaphysicians of science is that perhaps, right, we got perhaps one lesson, one metaphysics lesson to draw from some discussions in the areas is that we got stuck into um, just a, to a monolithic attitude to our notion of fundamentality. Maybe there are different notions of fundamentality. Maybe you should be pluralist about notions of fundamentality. I tend to think, for example, that primitive ontologists should go for a different notions of fundamentality than the ones we have here. And instead of actually me boring you with a metaphysics details here, I'm just gonna leave you with the words of one of the greatest writers of the last century, an Italian one. We have a lot of Italians here, so I hope that you enjoy that, which I think is exactly saying that. So this is a masterpiece of, uh, of, of, of Italian literature of the, uh, of the last century. This is the Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino. And so and I, I don't know whether, whether you know how the book works. The book works there. You know, Marco Polo describes the city of, 
to the Kublai Khan, the city of its empire. Because the Kublai Khan, this is such a great, I mean, a, a huge empire that the Kublai Khan, you know, has, has seen just three cities in his empire. So Marco Polo has, 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 you know, has traveled along. And so he actually, so he describes city by city. And at a certain point, he describes a bridge in one of the city. So the cities are always feel, names of beautiful women, whatever. It's, 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 it's really fantastic work. And the Kublai Khan says, so he describes this stone by stone. He says, okay, so the first stone here is, is, is slightly darker than the other one. And then if you, if you progress, it becomes always less dark and less dark. And then he goes, the Kublai Khan is just, you know, I don't have time for this, which is the stone that supports the bridge. Just tell me about that. And, 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 and Marco goes, well, it's not just one stone, it's the line that they form, right? And then the Kublai Khan has this monolithic monistic intuition. Well, then why do you think, why do you tell me about the stones? Just tell me about the entire thing, right? That's what's mattered, right? It's only the arch that matters to me. But Marco Polo sees the thing because it's the first one that says the bridge is not supported by, but by the line, right? But he says, like, without the stones, there is no arch, which I think I, I take it as saying, like, perhaps there are different notions of fundamentality here at play, in which on the one notion, the stones are really fundamental and the other ones. And I think that, I mean, I can't, I, Almost no one, but surely me cannot do any better than Italo Calvino. So I'm just going to leave you with, with Calvino and just thank you guys. Thanks. Yeah, so I have a, a question, which is just a request for clarification because I'm not well versed in uh, Mariology and I would like to have some further clarification on what is the claim that particles are parts of, uh, of the wave function because it just couldn't make sense of it. Uh, but again, I, you must be defining parts in some way that is not obvious to me at all. So that's one question. I just list my comments and then you decide uh, which one you answer first. So that's that's a question. Uh, the second is in a sense a confirmation of, uh, of your uh, uh, the doubts you casted on the old notion of fundamentality at play uh, at play in, the, in, in what you said uh, following the quote by Calvino. And, in, in, a, in listening to what you were saying, uh, my, my reaction was like, okay, wait, uh, maybe, I'm not, maybe I'm not really into what it's doing, but if I think of an entangled system, two facts are both true. So one is that uh, the, the amount of information in, uh, in, a, in a composite system is much is larger than uh, the information contained in the uh, Hilbert spaces uh, as, that I assigned to the two subsystems. So in this sense, it's just a fact that the composite system is somehow more than the two parts. In any you know, information-based uh, uh, view, I can, I can, I can take. Uh, so that's one fact. On the other hand, I have no, really in, in practice, I have no other definition of the composite system than first defining the two parts uh, in terms of the properties and then uh, defining the composite system. So from this point of view, I wouldn't know how to uh, simply take uh, the composite system as, uh, as uh, primitive and somehow then determine what the, what the parts are because I, I wouldn't know what definition I would take of the, of, the, of the composite system to start with. So that's the second comment. I think it, it's, a, it's just a different way of making the same point you were hinting at in the with the last uh, quote uh, but to me sort of it, it's a bit of a warning for the whole uh, story because uh, it seemed to say look you're just using a definition of fundamentality that is not fitting with anything we know about quantum mechanics regardless of how you then relate it to the notion of uh, localized in space or not uh, so is, there is a prior issue with, with the whole story before you try to connect with uh, with the localization okay this may be also a misunderstanding the third point is just a, a fact a, 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 again about localization my impression is that if you want to draw metaphysical conclusions about what is fundamental and what is not, whether localization is fundamental and has to be part of a fundamental metaphysics or not, then it's worth looking beyond the you know, uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. And it's a simple fact, uh, you know, it's a, it's a mathematical fact that regardless of how you exactly define uh, uh, the theory, which we don't know, in a 
in a straightforward quantum version of uh, general relativity, even if it's just an approximate construction, uh, but in an approximate uh, 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 quantum version of general relativity, there will be uh, the Hilbert space of the theory will simply not be localized uh, or factorizable in terms of uh, you know, a tensor product of factors uh, which correspond to local regions with respect to the manifold. So if the manifold is what you mean by space-time or space, well, there's simply no way in which the quantum states of the theory can admit uh, uh, a product structure uh, in terms of regions in manifold, in the manifold. That, that's a fact, I mean, there's no way around it. So either you define localization in a way that has nothing to do directly with localization on the manifold, and you have some other definition, which would be my option, or you simply don't try to relate uh, uh, this to tensor products. Good, thank you. So th these are all points that I'm, I'm actually just going to agree, but I'm, I'm going to going to say something, not just only. So first of all, first the the, the, the part thing. So now um, so there is no definition of part to, in, in the following sense. Part is just a primitive concept. It's just a primitive of, 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 your, of your ideology, not of your ontology. And then you define all the other ones from part. So, so, so you define proper part, which I define proper part is, the proper part that I talked about is just X is a proper part of Y, if X is part of Y and is distinct from it. And then you, you can define overlap, the, the notion I used, which is sharing of parts and so on and so forth. And you can do it in different ways. And you can do it in first order logic, you can do it with schemata, you can do it in first order plural logic, the axioms, and so on and so forth. Now, for the claim that the so, so that, that's the thing that's so you understood perfectly, perfectly right. I mean, meaning like, of course, you, you're going to take a primitive and you're going to define that, and that's what I usually do when I do just formal theories. Now, I didn't understand the claim that particles are parts, I don't get it either. It's just by the project of the paper, is right, it's so you can do two things, right? You can start and say, I, I, I just don't get it. I just don't understand. And my, my view here is, is not that. It's not that just, just I'm, I'm going to attack the preposition. Is a, I'm going to concede as much as I can and then show that these are problematic. I'm with you. I, that, that's why, in the end, I suggested that you shouldn't see them as parts, as a matter of fact. Right? So the entire conclusion of the argument I give for myself is exactly that. They just say that. So. And, and, and they don't have actually, I mean, David can confirm, they don't have that much of an argument. It says, well, part of it is the most, one of the most basic relations we have, why we don't use it. We don't see any problems in use it, given if, if, we do, if we don't see any problems, we should start from there. And what I do is that, well, there are problems, right? The ones that we, the ones that we saw. The second one is, I, I actually wrote an entire paper uh, on priority monism, exactly on this, saying exactly what you said, saying that you should have different relations which track different notions of fundamentality, and there's no need that they will go, that there's no need, okay, for the notions of fundamentality to align, okay? So I'm perfectly with you, right? Just, uh, so we, we can do the formal work. In that case, in just the purely metaphysical case, I did the formal work as a matter of fact. So I have to actually have a notion of fundamentality which is indexed to a relation and any relation backs up a conditional of the claim. If, R, if X is R related to Y, then X is more fundamental R than Y. And you would see by examples and priority monism being one of those that the R of fundamentality will not match. So I, I will go exactly like you did. So there's a sense in which of course the whole is more fundamental. There's another sense in which the parts are fundamental because I, I use them to, to, to build basically. I completely agree. Once again, there are two things, right, philosophically to do. One is, you know, just attack the presuppositions that they have, which is, which would be the same as before. And one is even grant the presuppositions and then see that that's a problem. In this paper, I'm doing the first thing. I think that even if you grant that much, I think it's still problematic. Okay, so I, I, think, I think that. Now, the most interesting thing, I think the localization thing is completely interesting because 
I am working on a theory of location for. So what the, it would be nice to see, so the following thing, right? So you have seen that there are different notions of location. What the argument you just suggested, is, it just seems that exact location is not gonna do the work. That doesn't mean that the other location relation will not do the work. And now I can show you that there are, you know, I, I, I can show, can I show a PDF of, 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 of a book in progress? Well, I'm not gonna show it, but there are theories of location in which you don't have actually the following thing. If they are somehow in some region, then they're exactly in one region. I can show you that there are theories such that this comes out, this doesn't come out as a theory. And therefore the, the chance, I mean, the hope here is because no one has done this formal work. We were just at the beginning because I think it's, it's or arguably probably it's the first book is gonna be written about this. Um, so there are formal theories that hopefully can handle that. Now it's another view whether you can have like imprecise localization and indeterminate location. This is another thing I'm interested independently uh, on. And I have, I, I, I have kind of a something using, using like, um, like no, no just to clarify, sorry, Claudio. I mean, my point in the more quantum gravity context uh, has nothing to do with the uh, quantum fluctuations on or uh, in determination of, of, uh, of values that would allow you to locate things. I'm just saying that uh, whatever you locate with respect to, that thing is mm -hmm. not the manifold. Oh yeah, but so yeah. So that's, that's my point. Yeah, okay, you must good, have good. some other notion good. of what you mean good. by something good. local. Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I, so then, then I completely misunderstood. Okay, good. So this is even better because, so it's true that metaphysicians has mostly talked about locations in the manifold. Now, as a matter of fact, one of the pitch of the book is that location is actually almost formal in the sense of formal from the great, the, you know, great tradition of formal ontology. Like, um, it's not really, but it's general. As a matter of fact, for example, one example that we have is that we have. I think you can be located in, 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 uh, in objects, you can be located in properties. So there's nothing in your theories of location that says that the second argument of the location relation needs to be a manifold. There's nothing in the theory that says so. You can actually play a lot with that. And I have, for example, a proof representation theorem that says that if you actually allow me that the determinable determinant structure, you can be located at, at properties which it's something that, for example, the early Russell thought, Liechtenstein thought, Meinung thought. And I know when, when you're in the company of Meinung, people start to worry. So, you know, but he was a great philosopher from that side. And so, and I can show you a presentation theorem that says, well, then you have a theory of location in that space. So nothing actually prevents you, the second argument to be way more general than a manifold. So, so I, I'm, a, it, it's true the following, right? It's true that, so usually we use in the book a locational structure. Locational structure is a triple in which you have like a domain of occupants, a set of loca location relations and a field of regions. And then you impose meriology on that and then you can impose the, the metric spaces, measurable spaces, topological spaces and so on and so forth. But nothing actually tells you that the field of regions needs to be space, space time, so on and so forth. As a matter of fact, we're very liberal about and um, so I, I tend to think that, for example, one good views about events is that they are, they are located in their participants. So for example, me, me, me you know, looking now intensely at Mauro is actually located at me and Mauro, not at the regions where me and Mauro are, at me and Mauro. So there's nothing that says that, you know, that restricts the nature of the field of regions in your theory, in your for, at least in your formal theory. Now, if you have metaphysical reason to say that location always behave that way, then I don't know what they are. And, and, and just to be completely honest, the fact that I, I don't use this thing to, to model, for example, quantum gravity and so on and so forth, is just because this theory is above my head. And I, I, I want to do, for my part, I want to be as honest as I can in my work. And, and so I can handle some physical theories, I cannot handle the others. And, if you want to work together on this, it would be nice, but I, I, I don't want to actually go to physical theories in which I don't know anything about and then you know, gasp for hair when people ask me questions. 
I, could, I know that I know a little, I just work on that. Um, I, I, I'm, 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 you know, I'm a formal metaphysician. I can do that work. Quantum gravity, unfortunately. Um, That's okay. I like you anyway. <laughs> I like you too. So there you go. Okay. On this uh, very nice note, we move <laughs> on to Davide. Okay. Uh, yes. So, Claudia, what I wanted to ask is um, if this new framework or work in progress framework, yeah, uh, you're using it, for example, to to make it clear um, what in at least I think it's a bit problematic. So the, the transition from configuration space to the dimensional space. I mean, every way function realism in configuration space finally had this problem that has to justify why we perceive the world in three dimensional space. Um, I was wondering whether um, you are also using this framework to clarify some of these points of the transition. So I, I'm, I'm using it in the paper, yes, to, to clarify at least what I think Alisa leaves underspecified. Mm. Uh, so in, in two respects. The first one is just a methodological point that she doesn't say about, she, she just, she doesn't say about the methodological structure of the wave. She just hand waves that, I think. And I think it's a crucial point, right? Because you can say to me, right? Well, well, you know, you, I can build a wave function from values and so on and so forth, which is completely fine. But if you want to be a monist of that stripe, right? You, what you shouldn't say is that points, values, and so on and so forth are parts. That she, she just, I think that she just hand waves there. She just, just then waving. So I, I'm, I am actually clarifying that. I think that's what they should say. Now, the other part that I'm clarifying, I think, if you bring in formal theories of location, it really clarifies the relationship between the locative talk. That's all it clarifies. And I think when you, you know, we chatted about it in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the workshop, right? If you clarify that, then you see how problematic it is. Because she only says that, oh, it's not, Mariology doesn't tell you that, right? It doesn't tell you where. Yeah, sure, Mariology doesn't, but location theory does. Mm. And if you look at the, the location theories that I know of, right? And now I'm surveying a lot of them because as, as I told you, like I'm writing a book, all the principles that I told you, like just come out as theorems. And, and therefore it does clarify that you're committed to that. Now, now you have a choice to make. You either say that, you know- the, So it, it can be- Sorry, I don't hear it, it, it can be a, a tool for configuration space realist to say something about the, the transition, for example? It could be. I mean, the, the, problem, the problem that I have is that if, so here, here's the problem that I have. Because if they go that way, it seems to me that they, it, as I showed you, right, it conflicts with very basic principles or very basic theories. Now, what they could say is they could say that, well, then in the end, the wave is located in, 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 in 3D space. But then I don't see now any advantage to, to just with a multi-field. Uh, why, why, why now you're not, if, if, if you're pressed there, then just look at the wave function in space, right? So that's why I think they don't want to say that. And it does clarify that, but once it's clarified, I think, I think it spells trouble. Okay, try. Uh, so I, no, I want to say maybe one advantage uh, not to be a multi-field uh, is like that. Actually, the multi-field, as I see it, it really works only if you have particles. So it only works in uh, in Bohm's theory, I guess. Okay, I see. Um, can, uh, can can you do? Can you can you actually? So he is with a thought, right? Given that some of these people, at least, want to recover three-dimensional space or four-dimensional space time, whatever, can you actually just have the multi-field, right, um, assign properties there? To you know, yeah. uh, this is the then this is the original multi-field of forest. So, uh, I mean, of course, they're going to be highly controversial kind of properties, right? So you're gonna be have properties like, oh, where something to be there, it would, it would have this acceleration, this velocity. But we're accustomed to it. We now have logics to actually 
you know, uh, lambda obstructions, things to, to do it. So there is a way, right? Um, and then again, Alista should be should be fine because she endorses she endorses actually particles in, in her ontology. So, um, so I, I mean, right? It's it's the entire thing about her, right? She wants to recover particles. As a matter of fact, it's a crucial step for her to recover first yeah. particles and then tables. So I think yeah. that maybe yeah, maybe you're right. But there are ways of actually in which still the multifield at that, at that point comes on top. I think that the best thing that she can do, honestly, is just, just give up the metrological claim. Just give up. If you, if you, if you have that view, don't say that three-dimensional objects are parts. Just find another relation. I think yeah, yeah. that's I the best they can do. Yes, I see your point. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much. I have a, a follow up uh, on David's question and uh, regards the explanatory value of the picture you have shown us. So let me reconstruct my, um, my reasoning. So you said that um, at the fundamental level, you have uh, configuration space facts. Okay. Then those configuration space facts determine facts about uh, um, parts uh, located in three-dimensional space, and in turn, facts regarding this part in three-dimensional space determine facts regarding a whole in three-dimensional space. Now, let's think about that in explanatory terms. And let's focus on 3D alone. I want to explain some fact about a whole, and then I use uh, facts about uh, its parts. So I have some sort of explanation. Now, imagine that I want to give a more um, fundamental explanation of this fact. Now, my perhaps naive idea of a, a more fundamental explanation is that of an explanation that adds details to a less fundamental one, okay? So that there is still some sort of conceptual continuity that goes from the more fundamental one to the less one. But what we have, we are just broadening the picture. And so we are understanding more from this uh, uh, more fundamental explanation. But now in this picture, the more fundamental facts are basically totally different in nature from the less fundamental one to the point that you have to adopt uh, a totally different vocabulary for using this uh, um, uh, explanation, a uh, more fundamental one. So doesn't that uh, disrupt uh, this sort of uh, explanatory unity, uh, organicity, if you want, uh, and in, in, in a sort of weird way that can be used to say, hey, perhaps this can, going for monism in this way it's not something that we might want. Yeah, so let, let me say something. Uh, so you might have this sort of, you might have this sort of complaint or worry, right? My feeling is that, so first of all, let me defend first my project. My project is, is once again, I'm granting these guys these things and then adding. So your, your, your suggestion would be, have you guys, have, have you thought about the explanatory structure of the things you're gonna say? And, and then uh, I, I'm with you that there might be some explanatory, um, you know, uh, weirdness lurking around. But my project was to stay within the boundaries that they themselves set. So that's why I didn't go there. Now, let me be the devil's advocate for a minute. If I were them, what I would say to you, look, I would say something like this, right? Uh, first of all, if you already bought into the layered conception of reality, right? if you already bought that, that, that view, chances are sooner or later, you're going to end up with some sort of explanations like this. Because for example, you're going to, if you trace, if you think that determination, for example, is transient, you're going to trace back explanations, for example, in, in, in terms of, you're, you're going to have some physical explanations for example, of some complicated social phenomena. So 
if you bought into the view in the first place, which I grant you, like it's a problematic picture. It's just that the ones they buy and I'm just working within that, right? You are used to these kind of things. So you are used to some sort of explanation, not all of them, right? But to some sort of explanation that will actually go interlevel, in, interlevels, right? And these will feature whatever you, you, you rightly pointed out, but they will say, Yes, and, 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 and that's, we're used to them. Like that's what we use when we do inter-level explanation. They can add a little bit more. And the, the following, the following, this one is even more contentious. The following is, suppose I can do, this is a huge formal claim. Suppose I can have just one relation of determination, okay, structure, you know, the entire hierarchy of levels of nature. Now, as a matter of fact, as I told you, and um, we were talking with Daniel, I don't think you can. I think you should be pluralist about that. But suppose that you can, right? You say, no, grounding does all the work. You, you know, you're a Geneva, like hardcore grounding theory. says, no, grounding does all the work. You don't need anything else. Now you say, grounding track gives you explanation that tracks relative fundamentality. So at the bottom, all you're giving me is just grounding explanation, right? And then of course, there are a lot of those grounding explanations are very different, but the nature of the explanation is the same. Now, this is a very controversial claim. It's just, a, it's just me playing the devil's advocate. As a matter of fact, as I told you, I have very pluralist inclinations here. And I don't think that one relation can structure the entire hierarchy of nature. Therefore, I would say that Actually, it would look with suspicion someone that actually insists that all explanations are of that kind. But, but I see a move that they can make. Um, so th that's what I reply for where they. Um, but of course, I, I, I don't know whether you share my pluralist inclinations, but I, I, th I, think, I think it's just, I don't have an argument here. I think it's just incredible to think that a relation can do that much. I just, just I have a feeling that it's too much to ask. But yeah, but this, of course, this is not an argument, right? I mean, what I can't see or what I can't do, it doesn't put any constraint on the world, unfortunately. Yes, Paul. No, I see. Uh, so uh, I think we uh, um, let Mauro ask a question because he has to go. So uh, Mauro, you can, you can go first. I really need a quick answer uh cloudy because i have to go in in a minute or so uh, the, the question is also quick what's wrong with tim's idea tim modrin's idea that the quantum state is a whole new category that doesn't fit in the, the you know talk of part whole which seem to me categories that come from ordinary language Quantum mechanics is very remote from our experience. Question, answer, nothing. Nothing is wrong with that. Like nothing is wrong with that at all. As a matter of fact, Tim Modlin is, is, is the, so the slide that I, that, I, that I skip over, Tim Modlin was the last guy. I think that there's nothing wrong. It's just one six, so for the project is, is, I'm just working within the confines of what they said. So they, they think that it's not. The only thing that, the only thing that I don't like, for example, about the Modlin's paper, the first paper that he wrote in 2013 and, and the paper that he wrote in 2019 is the following. That it, 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 the argument he gives is super quick. He just says that, you know, oh, we, we, we never thought about quantum mechanics. Therefore, this thing has to be something, something new, right? And, 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 every, and, every, and if, you, if you ask questions, just, it's just a waste of time. Then I, I don't, that I don't like. What I think it should be done is that we try, because at first we should try, and then at the end, this just has to be a final claim, not the, not the beginning claim. At, at, at the end, if we just think that it cannot fit, we shouldn't be, you know, just, you know, stomp our head and say, no, it has to fit in Aristotle's categories. But there has to be at the end of the journey, not, not just at the beginning of the journey. That's all, that, that's all, that's all the, the only fault I find in Modlin's argument. It just starts with that. It just starts, oh, we never saw this guy. And then it, it doesn't fit in any. 
Well, I, I, I've never saw Natalie Portman, but that doesn't mean she's not, you know, an animal, right? So at the end of the journey, that might be true. He might be right. Of course. I don't, I don't think there's, there's anything um, against Claudio, that. thanks for your, for your answer. Uh, so now it's Pedro's turn. Okay, all right. Um, thanks, uh, Claudio, for your um, talk. I definitely have to get uh, way deeper into this uh, metaphysical business because, uh, well, coming from theoretical physics, it's, <laughs> I found it a bit uh, tough to to go through some of the arguments in the end. But okay, it's just a talk, so I look, have a look at your paper and references during. So my question is, uh, my comment perhaps is just fairly basic actually. And, and <laughs> it's uh, kind of overlaps with uh, Daniele's, uh, Davides and even Antonio's remarks already. I mean, I sympathize, uh, although of course I, I consider, I mean, there are pros and cons with uh, monism in, in general. I do sympathize with that because of uh, my, uh, well, Machian um, ideas. But what I don't understand, and it's some recurring theme in, in philosophy of physics, is uh, because one thing is to basically claim that uh, monism, for what reason, is a uh, compelling view to endorse. That's one thing, and quite another thing is that the word that I don't get is why people tend to focus, I mean, to relate that monism to configuration space. And so, I mean, just uh, think of, for example, and because uh, the wave function monism is just an instance of uh, configuration space realism. So, but, uh, of course, I, I'm uh, not aware of all the different uh, categories that philosophy of physics are called uh, wave functions. So, but from the physical point of view, and, and I guess that uh, many of you in, in, in here know, I mean, this is uh, basically a highly complex uh, mathematical entity that basically conveys and codes uh, the way that, that uh, basically quantum entities, uh, what are particles, fields, they, they are dynamic, they are dynamics. So one thing of uh, endorsing this uh, monism what, uh, is, okay, we have this uh, fundamental, and this is uh, something I mean, a bit controversial, I mean, what fundamental is, uh, as Daniel has you already uh, pointed out, but if we have this fundamental view about quantum dynamics, but that in no way, I mean, uh, allows you to, well, you, you could have been just uh, because of some uh, uh, preference, but um, physically speaking, there is uh, basically no reason why you should go from quantum dynamics itself to this uh, highly complex mathematical entity that is uh, way fun. I mean, Schrodinger himself, I mean, when he, uh, in that uh, series of famous papers, uh, Basically, the way he discovered quantum mechanics was basically by analogy with Hamilton, Hamilton Jacob's theory and icon approximation. So, and many people now, in, for example, in quantum information theory, I mean, uh, but has nothing to do with that. But okay, I mean, the, 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 the way that they endorse is basically the same. It's just a, a matter of basically encoding the information regarding so your system. So, I mean, I, um, I'm not sure whether you agree or not, because uh, sometimes I tell you whether you are actually taking for granted just for the sake of argument, and basically you go ahead, or you yourself basically um, endorse and share this uh, view. So my point is that in, in, in my point, uh, I mean, uh, I may uh, sympathize with uh, quantum dynamics as a fundamental, Granted that basically we have a fundamental uh, notion um, of reality, of ontology, but without any, any, any sort of fundamental wave function. And, and as such, there is no wave function monism. I mean, you, you may call it, I don't know, um, world cosmos monism, uh, I don't know. 
but no wave functions. So, uh, and, and this, again, this is uh, perhaps a very old uh, uh, controversy, but I just don't get, uh, and I'm not sure whether money or people in philosophy of physics, I mean, uh, associate uh, monism with configuration space because uh, um, I mean, I put this under, uh, entertain uh, being a monist uh, just in physical space. And so sorry for the, for the long uh, discourse, but uh, uh, and for the many overlaps with previous. Um, no worries. Like I, I can stay a little bit longer. I don't care. So don't worry. My, my, my life is pretty boring, so I can stay. Long. No, no, I think you complete. So first of all, let me, let me put even my cards on the table. I don't have sympathies for wave function realism. Just, I don't. I'm, wave function realism as a wave function, it's a field in configuration space. I don't have, I don't have sympathies, as a matter of fact. It's just, as I told you, it's just like, a, a, so the formal expertise that I had in theories and parts and holes, I think could clarify some things that the, the, they're being said in philosophy and physics right now. And then I thought, I, I'm just gonna do that. But it's also fair, to say that it's not true that all the monists, even in quantum, quantum monists, are monists about configuration space entities. So for example, Schaffer is pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty explicit that he thinks the cosmos, like the mirrorological sum of all concrete objects is the fundamental thing. So what, another thing that you can do that in the paper I explore is at, that you can take state space, space-time realism, has the way, at, as, as Will Wallace and Timpson has, say that the way the universal wave function represents some sort of property-like entity, and then claim that from this you can define density matrices for all the subregion of space-time, and then you will have that the that the fundamental entity is space-time. But but you have to take another approach to the wave function. So th there's a particular there's a particular subset of philosophers of physics that wants to take wave function monies up to configuration space. Not all of them, to be fair. And so, um, and it might very well be that these people, all these people that I know of, that I can think of that want to do that move, like Alyssa, Jill, Peter, and so on and so forth, they were wave function realists before they were monists. So th this is just a sociological explanation. They believe that the best, the best ontological reading of the wave function was a field in configuration space. Way before attaching that to the monist metaphysics. Oh, and this is the only fundamental thing there is. They attach that later. So they, they were already committed to the view that um, the, the, way, the, the best way of understanding the wave function was a field in configuration space. And to their, um, and, 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 and so they had diff, completely different arguments for that. Monism didn't even enter the picture. Yeah. They thought that no other picture could vindicate the fact that in entanglement, you had no local correlations. Now, they recognize that, that the argument that they had before is just very weak. Um, so they recognize that in print. But, but they had endorsed wave function realism in that sense for different reasons before. It might very well be just a sociological thing. And then they say, because then they realized, well, look, I mean, facts about the wave function determine everything else. And isn't it a feature of the fundamental that it should determine everything else? Oh, yes, it should be. Then why not be modest about the wave function? That's, I think, how it went. But this is just me speculating about a piece of psychology here. Uh, it's, not, it's not a philosophical argument, right? But, 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 but there are versions of monism, even monism. And, and, and in, in, the, in the part that we didn't go through, in the speculation part, in the speculation part, I have a bunch of different ways of being a monist in which you, you are not, as a matter of fact, a configuration space monist. You are either a Hilbert space monist, like the view of Carol and Singh, for example, or you are a space, four dimensional space time monist, in which you have four dimensional space time be the, the fundamental entity, like state space, state space time, state space realism, this is a mouthful. So there are, it's just that for the purpose of the paper, I just, there are already a lot to, 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 to be done there, right? So for example, like 
I am the one that suggested that regimentation of fundamentality. They just say fundamental. They don't even do the work. They just say fundamental and that's it. And, and I'm with you, like, I think that this is just one way of saying fundamental. And I think there are different ways and it's a lot. And, and that's why I think metaphysicians like me that, that know a little bit, they know physics, but are not physicists and, and cannot do it at higher level, like the quantum theory, unfortunately, right? Can help there because I can do the, 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 that homework of specifying what fundamental, if you have that view, can mean, and that's what I did. And then I know the papers have another notion of fundamentality, and then you can ask whether they are equivalent. I, for example, think that they're not. As a matter of fact, I think that they're not. And I think that you can prove, for example, that here's two notions of fundamentality, one that they need, one that they, I think uh, they don't. One is that the fundamental things are not fixed by anything else. And the other, another view is that the fundamental things fixes everything else. Now, they just don't say anything about this, but I think that these two notions can be pulled apart. And I think I can prove a formal result to the point that they are equivalent if and only if fixing is a strict order that obeys some sort of augmentation principle. That is, if you give me a partial set of fixing things, then I can always augment it to give you the full thing. If you don't have these things, I think you can pull them apart. And that's where I think metaphysicians and formal metaphysicians in particular can, can play a role. We can distinguish these two things, give you formal theory so that you, like I did in the case of location, so that you can see that there are different notions of fundamentality. And then you have to tell me which one you, 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 you want, right? And then, but here I'm just working within the framework that they have, because I still think it's problematic in and on itself, even if you stick to that. I share your impression, guys, that this framework might be strict, uh, and I'm a sucker for pluralism. So, but, 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 but I think it's a point to be made that even if you work within the structure of that program, there are some problems there. There are some problems. I think, I'm not, I'm not trying to convince anyone. I'm, but I think that there's some problems. Um, even if you stick to the level in which fundamental means whatever I told you and I formalized, even if they don't do, part of behaves the way I told you and location behaves the way I told you. That, that they, I think, implicitly assume. Even if you stay in those confines, I think you're gonna run into some problems. I think the lesson to be taken is that you should abandon those confines, as a matter of fact, right? But, but I mean, but they're, they're better philosophers than I am, so. I've been known to be wrong. Let's, let's, let's put it this way. I've been known to be wrong. <laughs> it happened once or twice. Okay. Um, next in line, we have Johan. Sorry, thanks, thanks a lot, Claudio. Thanks yeah, a lot. Of course. No, this is great. Hi, Johan. Uh, I have a question about your definition of separability star. Uh, in particular, um, uh, I would like to ask about its uh, relation to uh, the levels account, because uh, at some point uh, on your slides, you have um, some attempts to define fundamental separability, but you moved <laughs> fast over this and uh, you went to your preferred definition of separability, but it does not have any relation uh, uh, to levels, I mean, the separability stir. Uh, so in particular, uh, one might ask uh, whether uh, um, your, meta uh, okay, your metaphysics uh, is separable stir, but is it fundamentally separable stir? And um, I, uh, <laughs> I have some print skins of some of your slides. And uh, I know that you had two versions of fundamental separability. Uh, one is that uh, what, um, uh, that it is for fundamental holes. And the other one is that parts are fundamental. So if we take, um, so if we, um, if we formulated um, uh, a diversion of, uh, fundamentally separable star in the first manner, uh, then I think the metaphysics you proposed to would uh, 
not be fundamentally separable because uh, the fundamental whole um, does, does not have uh, any parts, right? And uh, is this right? And, so, uh, so the, the, the trick, so the, you're completely right in, in one sense. So it doesn't mention fundamentality because I tried and I try what you usually try like in philosophy uh, or, or in, when you do formal work. So if someone comes and say, you know, here's, here's a principle, here's a counterexample. And you think the counterexample comes from that. And you say, oh, maybe if I restrict that notion, right? And what you do is you just restrict the quantifiers and you do it in, in a bunch of ways. So that, that's what they do in fundamental separability one and two. And it just so happens that it doesn't work. Now, fundamental separable star is cooked in such a way that if you, if you look at the logical formalization, which we, we didn't go into, it turns out that if, if something doesn't have any parts, if it's an apple, it's just trivially separable. So it's so the, 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 config, the wave function turns out to be separable in configuration space, because the claim is going to be that if it is a composite object, then it's fixed by its parts. But of course, it's not a, a composite object. Therefore, it's just separable right? because if you use the conditional analysis, the, the, the antecedent turns out to be false. Or if you say, like even if you take fundamental whole and you say every, every fundamental whole is such that its state it fits by the state of its parts. Well, if it's an atom, it has only one part itself. And of course, the state of itself fixes the state of itself. So the trick here is that if you have something which is an atom, okay, the definition of separability star will actually uh, in, entail that it's separate. So it is separable star at the configuration space now. So, but that's that's how, but but you're complete. You, you saw something deep here. That's why the claim that I made, which Elisa doesn't make, that the, 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 the wave function has no parts of configuration space now, is crucial. That is crucial to my entire argument. And as David can attest, because I don't know guys whether you read the, page, the, the book, but David was invited. Uh, we, we invited him in, in, in a workshop on that book, so he, he read it carefully. So Alisa neither endorses nor rejects the claim. That's something I added on top to make, to make the theory better, as a matter of fact. But it, you, you, you saw, I think you saw something, meaning like that's crucial for the wave function to be separable stuff. That's completely crucial. It turns out that it is, but without that, you, you can run into problems. But with that claim, you're fine. Unless, <laughs> unless I'm completely mistaken. But it's so the, the, the thought here is that, right? So the thought is that if you think about it, right? Separability tells you something about the composition, the state of the whole, once you think the state of the proper parts. It's natural to think that if this thing that doesn't have any proper parts, it's just going to be separable. Because, because of course the state, the state of its parts are gonna fix that. It's, there's only one part. Because it doesn't have by definition any proper parts. So so it, it yeah, so once again, I think I think the, the, the question really hides something deep here. And it also it's a good lens to see how crucial that claim is in the entire argument. Because it seems like it's just, just a claim that you can add. Right? And it's just a tiny claim in a, a, a hour of talk, but it does a lot of work. It really does. I see, thank you.